we'll get started because we got plenty to say. Sure. Right. So um, we're recording, but I'll ask you to make that announcement when you call to order, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody ready? Places, everyone. All right. I am now calling the regular meeting of the town services and outreach committee of the town council to order on February 9th, 2023 at 7.01 PM. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted as there is nowhere to be, uh, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I'm now going to call on the TSO members. We do have a, a small quorum, but we have a quorum uh, to ensure that you can hear me and be heard. So Andy Steinberg. I'm here. Glad to see you. And Dorothy Pam. I am here. All right. And we are waiting on uh, Shalini Balmilne, who hopefully will join us. Um, and we will welcome her when she does. Um, all right, meeting has been called to order. We're gonna go move on to public comment. <clears throat> public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the TSO committee may be made at this time. Residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes. We're gonna give you three today. Uh, and we will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. In order to participate in public comment, you can raise your hand if you are on Zoom. I will check to see if there are hands raised. I just felt like we needed hold music here. All right, I am not seeing any hands raised. Going once. Okay. Uh, all right, moving on. We do not have any town manager appointments this week. So let's um, move on briefly to approval of the minutes. We have one set of minutes from January 26th. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve those minutes or does anyone have any correction? No. Yeah, Dorothy? I'll move we approve them. Great. No, second. Thank yeah. you. And I'm gonna go in reverse order this time. I will vote aye, Dorothy, to approve yes. the minutes. Yes. And Andy? Yes. All right. Oh, and here's Shalini, awesome. Hi Shalini, welcome. Hello. All right, so you can hear and be heard. And um, just for the minutes note, it is 7, excuse me, 7.03. Um, Shalini, we just approved the minutes and there was no public comment. So we're moving on to the street dating policy, excuse me. Um, Mandy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank um, you for having me. There is an updated draft of the street lighting policy in the folder for today's meeting. Mandy, do you wanna start us off with uh, sharing what changes were made to this or would, is there a different, and I'm not seeing James in the audience yet. Um, yeah, um, I, I can start off. I think we tracked the changes in the document, but basically based on the last conversation, um, one of the changes is just we, didn't have the right word in there. <laughs> we were talking about surveillance use. And so that was just language pulled from a different bylaw that we forgot to change the thing for. But the, the bulk of the changes were based on the conversation that we had the last time we were at TSO um, regarding um, locations. And there was a lot of concern about the lighting zones that we had defined and then what it what where what we were putting in each lighting zone and how um, that may um, would likely reduce the number of streetlights in town by a lot. And there was a lot of concern about that. And so listening to that, we'd always talked about that this sort of was a pr proposed policy that was in two parts, um, standards and then locations. And so we've taken the location set of this proposed policy and removed everything that was there related to those locations. Um, we've got it in other documents for later discussion and all. And in its place, um, we basically put in the current street light policy that pertained to locations. Um, and so you can see that in the attached, the farther down in the modified document, you can see the current policy. Um, the, the one thing that we did not transfer over, the language is not the same because we're trying to match the language to the current policy, right? Um, so, but the the location 
um, standards that were are in the current policy that, that we follow um, were transferred over except for one instance, which is the end, dead ends and cul-de-sacs. Um, uh, again, with the belief that lighting at dead ends and cul-de-sacs is there to announce um, the dead end or the cul-de-sac so people don't fall off the end of the street um, or drive off the end of the street, um, but that reflectors especially it, when you're walking, you aren't going to fall off or drive off the end of a street very quickly, right? Um, and so, and you should have your own light with you. Um, so it's more of a concern about drivers not noticing that the street is ending. Um, and if that's the case, reflectors with the lights that cars bring on their own serve that same purpose um, and serve that purpose without the same costs that lights do um, and negative costs that lights do for people and animals, but also maintenance costs. There's no electricity involved in putting up a reflector and all. And so we did not transfer the dead end and um, cul-de-sac street light portion over to this proposed section G. Um, that's the only thing we didn't transfer over. Uh, the rest is what you would find in the policy we are currently under that was adopted by the select board um, back in what 2001 or something like that. So those are those are the changes. Thank you so much for for walking us through that. Are, are there any questions from members of TSO? And I'd also oh, like to oh, welcome sorry, Jane. I forgot one more thing. Yeah. Um, I added in a F3, the materials and equipment standards, and a seven pin receptacle requirement um, was added in based on uh, conversations at MMA with lighting providers that said, if you don't have seven pins, you can't do all of the potential dimming programming and all of that that we may want to do, such that um, while we may not initially um, take advantage of all of that information. If we're replacing the fixtures, we want to make sure that that ability is there in the future. And so we want to make sure that we purchase uh, fixtures that have that numbers of respects, receptacles in case we want to use those features in the future. So that was the other change. Sorry, Anna. No, no that was fine. Thank you. Um, I also want to welcome James, excuse me, James Lowenthal. Um, and James is a panelist. There he is. Hello. Um, James is a professor of astronomy at Smith College, right? Did I get that right? Um, there we go. That's what I thought. And uh, has been, he's also very involved in the Dark Skies Initiative. And so he's been advising Mandy and I as the sponsors of this um, and is a wealth of knowledge. So we're very, very grateful for him, uh, to him for being here as a subject matter expert. I'm gonna to turn to, James, did you have anything to add before we go to questions or do you want, okay. All right, so going to questions from the committee, Dorothy. Okay, so I have a couple of just general background questions. Um, so I, I read part of this earlier, but today I sat down and read it through again. And I wanted to know how much does this document resemble the document that is at present in DPW? Because I, I, there were times when I thought, I can't believe you're, you're making the statements that you're making about this has to be the best, the most, the what's. And I thought we're going to have to hire consultants to double check that. Um, material, material and equipment standards, they sounded just so, I mean, I do understand. Now I see this is where your seven pin receptacle, which is, which sounds interesting. But is this the kind of, language that they use now because if it isn't i could just see them feeling very insulted at the micromanagement of every single detail of this because they're the department that's supposed to be in charge of lighting i can certainly see the town council coming to say we want to shield light uh in ways to um not hurt nature as much and to and to you know to allow us to have dark skies i can see a general statement of goals i see that as coming from us but the idea that we would go into this detail in an area where we have professionals First, is is old. um it, it's it's bothersome to me so i'd really want to hear uh, like from paul is this the kind of 
Is this, are they used to this? Is this the kind of document that they have and we're just kind of making a few changes in it? Or is this a kind of micromanagement that they're not expecting? So before I turn to Paul, I'm gonna give Mandy a sponsor and I'd also like to answer as sponsor if that's too, if that's all right as well. Um, so this has, DPW Guilford has seen this, um, this is not new. Our former streetlight policy um, for, for the record is at the bottom of the, um, it's in the packet. So if you scroll down, it is one whole page. Um, and so yeah. it is extremely lacking in, in our opinion. Um, if you would like to compare this to other towns, other towns do have yeah. this level of detail. Uh, DPW is very familiar with the language that we utilize. It's pulled off, a lot of this is pulled from manuals that they utilize and best practices that they utilize. So it's uh, this is another one where we are updating something that's very out of date. Um, and, and this has been, this is not a surprise to DPW. I think the issue, Dorothy, is that in order to say the things that you're saying on a conceptual level, you have to give the detail. Um, it's it's a little, it's it's tough to say, we want to be kind to nature in our streetlights. Like that's very philosophical and it's very worthy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big, big, broad spectrum, right? So it's very easy to meet that by doing one tiny little thing. And, and we think we're better than that. And so we can, um, not in a snooty way, but you know, uh, in a way of, we know that we can do better. And so by giving this level of specificity, we're saying this is how we want to be kinder to our natural environment and our, our physical health. Um, so I, in my opinion, that level of specificity is necessary in this policy. Mandy, do you have anything to add before we turn to Paul? I think Anna covered it from my point of view. Uh, Paul. You're mute. You know you're muted. You're figuring it out. You got this. Um, yeah, so I think I think what Anna said is there virtually isn't much of a policy now. So this would be a new pol a policy for the first time. Um, and I think that that's what's important. I think the question will be is what is the cost of implementing the pro of the policy? You know, the um, going to the seven pin adapter, there's a cost to that. And so all these different things have costs associated with them. So um, it's just a matter of when you look at policy with anything for the council, you want to look at, you would ask the DPW, what is the cost to implement and what's the time frame for implementing? Okay. Yeah, because I had, there was one other small place where it seemed to me that you were going to have to, on the materials and equipment standards, um, that it it seemed to be so complex well, that you would, you'd have to, what you wanted to have them do, that you would need to hire a contractor to do that. But if you tell me that, no, they actually do this kind of stuff all the time and they know these things. Because um, when you say the Amherst shall use the most efficient, effective type of light fixture, um, and you have to determine efficiency and effectiveness, fixture cost, installation, maintenance, labor, manufacturer warranty, energy use and cost, light quality, and fixtures, life cycle cost. I, you know, I could see trying to figure out doing a, a study of that being a pretty complicated thing. Um, but again, you know, I don't work for DPW, but I'm just, it seemed like it might be. I, sometimes I just feel you're just going too far into the details, but I, I do I do accept that you're saying we don't really have a policy. It's not up to date. Uh, other towns have similar policies and we need to do it too. But I, I think maybe I, I just would pull back a little bit. I just, I think it's a little bit too bossy, I guess I'd say. So um, Mandy, I don't know if you, you wanna go first this time. I, I, would, I would call on James. Yeah, James. Actually, um, before we do, oh. I must say that the comments that I was going to make are identical to what Dorothy said. Mm -hmm. I think that we are going far beyond the capability of counselors to understand what they're being asked to adopt. And that we are going into far greater detail that is appropriate in a bylaw. <clears throat> that a bylaw ought to set standards of what we want, but we need to trust our professional staff yeah, to yeah. interpret the bylaws and implement them in a way that is um, both feasible um, and is uh, something that is affordable. And I'm not 
I, I just don't think that this bylaw is an appropriate one to recommend to the council because it's you're asking the council to adopt something they're going to be totally incapable of understanding. And I don't think that um, it is the business of the council to get into the level of detail and directing what is to be done that is here and at as an unknown cost. And uh, there's nothing that has happened in the bylaw that makes me any more comfortable than I um, about it. This has been my hesitation about this since the first time I saw it. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, Can I Nancy? just make one clarification? Sure. This is not a bylaw proposal. This is a streetlight policy under our public ways control of the public ways that we are the keepers of the public way so so in that sense it's more like a regulation than it is a bylaw and i just want to keep that clarification in our minds um general bylaws are different than regulations and policies okay. I, I appreciate that thank you for correcting me on that it doesn't change my view though because this is the kind of bylaw um, or regulation, I should say, I keep getting the wrong word. It's the kind of regulation that I would expect from professional staff to propose to us, not us to propose to them. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take back my chair gavel here for or my vice chair gavel here for a moment. Um, thank you for your for your question, Andy. Uh, Mandy, would you like to respond to the latter point? Um, I, I'll let James speak first. Great. Um, James. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, once again, my name is James Lowenthal. I'm professor of astronomy at Smith College, and um, I am very active in uh, efforts to protect the nighttime environment from my backyard to the city of Northampton, to the state of Massachusetts, to the United States, to United Nations. Uh, I'm uh, in many different ways, uh, and I'm intimately familiar with this issue and the, the issues that are uh, expressed in this policy. And I want to uh, first just acknowledge that on um, all the concerns that we heard just now and also at the last time this was discussed on this body are ones that are often raised by other communities. And I want to put that in the perspective that uh, everything in that you see in this proposed policy is uh, so common that uh, the International Dark Sky Association Massachusetts chapter now has a, a template uh, recommended bylaw, in that case actually a bylaw, but it's meant to be adopted however cities and towns in Massachusetts want to adopt it, that has significant overlap with the one that you see before you. So many, many elements in there are exactly what other towns are already doing and that we recommend to other towns. And the problem is, I mean, you're, I think what we've just heard from Dorothy and Andrew are, uh, they're reasonable concerns. It was too much specificity. Uh, who are we to, to, to tell our DPW, our experts about this level of detail? But in fact, it's exactly what's required. And all our experience shows that if you don't do that, then you don't get the result you want. And it's just an unfortunate fact about lighting that it is complicated. The values that uh, that Anna and Mandy articulated are so simple. We wanna protect the nighttime environment for human health, for wildlife, for safety, to see the stars, to uh, conserve energy. It's so simple. We, I'm sure everybody here agrees with that. But to implement that, requires diving into the details in ways that, in fact, most engineering departments, including here in Northampton, including there in Amherst, are not equipped to do. They do not have training in lighting. And all the decisions around the state, around the country, around the world, 90% of them or more, I'm making this up, are made by people who have no idea how lighting actually works and what the impacts are and what good lighting is and what bad lighting is. And they're generally influenced directly by consultants and industry representatives who have vested interests in just selling equipment and Chinese uh, manufacturers that 
um, that produce terrible lights by the thousands upon thousands. And as long as they sell, they keep making them. And so, so there's no attention to the issues that we just said are important, you know, protecting human health and, and wildlife and so on. And those decisions happen again and again. They're, they've happened all across the state and the country. And the result is that light pollution is growing by leaps and bounds. And a new report just came out, in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, that showed that light pollution is growing at an astonishing 10% per year, which far outpaces population growth and development. So all of us are using more light per capita every year. And this is because of bad decisions, not intentional, but just because because people are ill-informed, including the decision makers in departments of public works all around the state and the country. So unfortunately, the bottom line is this level of specificity is appropriate and required actually to help cities and towns make the right decisions. Now, whether it has to come in exactly this package or that package, I can't say, but I can guarantee you the DPW, well-intentioned as they are and experienced as they are at what they do, they are not experts at lighting in the way that uh, that needs to be to protect the nighttime environment. If I might just say one more thing about the cost issue. Sure. The, to put the in, in the biggest picture, I would say what we're asking is how much is it going to cost to turn some lights off? And <laughs> it, 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 that, of course, I mean, it, it's a it's ironic because we're talking about saving energy and um, and uh, bringing back the stars and improving health and improving safety by turning lights off. It's such a win-win. There might be some costs up front. It's true. It's true that seven pin ready lights uh, need to be, I I'm so glad that, uh, that that's included now. They absolutely need to be included uh, because uh, dimming controls are absolutely the way of the future. There is no question that 10 years from now, if you put those lights in without the ability to dim and control them, you'll say, what were we thinking? And it's such an immediate way to save energy and uh, reduce light pollution and save money. It's a small investment, but the, re the return on investment is gonna be less than those 10 years, that I can guarantee you. Northampton has done the same thing. They the, the, All the lights here in Northampton are seven pin ready. Many other cities in town, for example, like Cambridge, actually bought the controllers to go with those seven pin uh, and they dim their lights regularly. And when it gets to midnight, they cut them to 50%. You can control it however you want. You could turn them off after two o'clock in the morning. Or, uh, and you know you could do it with uh, a cell phone. The, the um, uh, Paul, you could do it or, the, or, or Guilford could do it uh, from a cell phone or a laptop. Uh, so there are many benefits. It saves money because uh, you know exactly which light is malfunctioning. So you don't, instead of having to pay somebody to go around with a bucket loader and examine the lights one by one to find a problem light, you get it right there in your cell phone. Um, so the, the savings are very significant. In the future, there will be uh, a direct energy savings as well from dimming the lights that, that will help you realize those benefits economically. And one last thing about the cost, uh, good lights don't cost more than bad lights. One example, the town of Pepperell, Massachusetts, which recently uh, redid their street lights with LEDs, they went through a major uh, vetting process where um, the town uh, put up a, a demonstration of a wide array of different lights and asked the public uh, in a survey, which ones do you prefer? And they overwhelmingly preferred the ones that were the least bright, the least blue, and the least glary. So they were the best lights. And it turns out those were the cheapest ones. So the, the city saved money and, uh, and, uh, and got better health. So there are direct uh, economic benefits to public health. And, you know, it's all the same reasons that we invest in water safety and air quality. Say, uh, those are direct values and direct benefits, and it may cost money to do it, but it's still the right thing to do. Thank you, James. Mandy? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to add a couple of things. Um, as it relates to cost, I talked to the Pepperell Town Administrator um, at MMA. They replaced approximately 400 lights and the fixtures within the lights for approximately two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. That was a number of years ago, but that gives you an I, I I thought that would be a nice number to hear in terms of just an idea of what something might be. I think we're we have about seven or eight hundred lights. I'm not sure. It depends on what we do with the lights we have in terms of the policy. Um, 
the timing of it, I spoke to Guilford recently at a gathering, and he said the the lights that we have on our street lamps are at the end of their useful life, okay. um, <laughs> meaning that they went in 10 to 15 years ago, and they're approximately slated to last 10 years. So I know that was a question that this committee had asked about, what is it? And so we're starting to see the failures. And so without a policy, which goes to my next point, there's no, we don't know what will get purchased, right? There's no mm -hmm. guidance on what to purchase and what they should look like. And if we're starting to replace now that they last 10 years or more, um, and then put a policy in place in three years, mm -hmm. it, it's better to put that policy in place now if we're at the end of the useful life and thinking about potentially whether this policy is there or not needing to do a relamping because we've hit the end of the useful life of all the lamps in our town. Um, so we want to be able to put that in before we start buying three or 400 of these so that we know we're getting what we want, which takes me to some of what James was saying in terms of and the concern that you have about specificity. So I'm looking at the policy and it's great to say we don't want to damage, you know, harm human health. Um, but what does that mean? And so that's where we get into saying, you know, we don't want um, we we don't want uplight, right? And then we have to define what uplight is. We don't want to be lighting the sky, or we only want to light the portion of the area that is not the house behind the street light. Well, then you have to define what that means. If we if we as a council say we don't want to light someone's yard because it's just or the house, we don't want that light shining into their home, if we don't define how to determine that, we can't really determine how to buy a fixture that doesn't do that or to buy the appropriate fixture to keep from doing that. If we want a certain spectrum, a policy that doesn't talk about the spectrum gives the, um, the, the, the purchasers, the DPW who would be purchasing this or a purchasing agent, the ability to pick any spectrum. And so if we don't put some of these specifics in, we haven't given guidance because, you know, there's a spectrum, there's a wide spectrum of blue light to yellow light that these LEDs come in. We see it in our own town where on one street, they're very blue and on another street, they're not quite as blue. And so if we don't put any spectrum in at all and just say, you know, something that works, there's, we haven't given the guidance that we thought we've given. And so I know it's very complicated in the sense that it's hard to understand what some of these numbers mean or what they do, but they're standard numbers. Um, and it's the it's it's those that sort of specificity that actually helps the people doing the purchase order, the people doing that RFP, know what they're looking for and what they need to buy. Um, because otherwise they could buy another 4,000 Kelvin light, and that's not what we want because that's too blue. Um, so we have to put some sort of Kelvin number in if we don't want the blue lights bought. Thanks, Mandy. Mandy, could you remind me, you had a stop now at 7.30? Uh, eight. Eight, okay, great. Um, Shalini? Yeah, thank you for clarifying the timing piece. Uh, I think that's really important that knowing that so we can plan for this policy to be in place by the time we are ready for replacement. My question again around the process is that I don't necessarily see it as uh, it's either DPW or experts. The, I mean, the way I'm envisioning it is that the experts like yourself, James, are working with the staff and and then maybe it is maybe what this is proposing is what uh, the staff, I mean, I would prefer that the experts look at this with the staff because there is, um, having been an academic myself in marketing, a different field, but then I went into the actual field of marketing. I'm like, whoa, there's a bit of a gap there just because of the practicality of things and other factors, which is where I think the town staff comes in. So I think there needs to be that conversation between the town staff and experts looking maybe at this document and uh, seeing for our town what makes sense from the town staff point of view 
and then coming back to us with maybe it's exactly this uh, and then also getting input from the public like what because this is like very dense and as Jordi was saying kind of complex but like what will it look like for people living in their homes what will it look like for the downtown businesses so if we could break up what is the implication of this going to be for residents for businesses in different areas for bikers for so if we could get the consequ you know implications of that for the different constituents then we could maybe hold a public forum and uh, kind of say okay what is your feedback and you know what are their lived experiences and challenges if i could respond briefly as a sponsor i think um shalini i i love your your last point there about um, visualizing this for people. And if you remember back to the initial presentation Mandy and I made, we included some visual representations of what this looks like, right? So what these fixtures look like and what the, um, what the light looks like. Other towns have done really interesting things where they've actually set up some of the lights to, to demonstrate for people. Um, that would be amazing. We would love to do that. Uh, but I think for for now we've got the we've got pictures, um, and obviously you know maybe we can include those in a in a future packet again so that people can reference them um, to see what this looks like, um, what the different light level temperatures look like, what the different shieldings look like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can definitely do that. I think to your first point, you know regarding who, I think regardless of whether or not we like the process of who brings what forward, um, I we are allowed as counselors to bring policies forward like this. I'm, you're not, I'm not saying you were, we weren't saying this. And I think that as we notice concerns or issues and as we hear about them from residents or as they come up for us, um, you know, that's, that's where this mm. came from. Um, and so we see that all over the place, right? And so this regulation, um, Mandy, Mandy brought it forward from, I believe, a, a resident concern, right? And so, um, and then it, it grew from there. So not everything will always come through staff. And, and I guess I'll speak for myself only. I don't think everything needs to come through staff. I think sometimes we notice things that um, staff, our staff do an incredible job uh, and, and we have a different perspective. And so sometimes we see things that, that they have been, you know, operating under for a while, and we say, you know what, I think, I think we're better. I think we can do better, um, and that's my kind of take on why this came forward from us and not from DPW. Can I uh, respond to that or a follow up question, clarification? Sure. So, in terms of the public engagement, I know you showed us the images of what this kind of lighting will look like, what that looks like, but I'm thinking more in terms of the changes that are going to be made in different zones, apparently. So how it might affect, or maybe it doesn't, and that's fine too, but it sounds like it's going to have a different impact for shopkeepers or businesses downtown or in the village centers versus the residential areas. And then there's some places where people have been complaining it's too dark, and so how yeah. it might actually get better for them. So, so I'm going to pause you really quickly because we split them for that. Mandy, do you want to, we split them up. So this is, this is, Mandy, go ahead. So, so. I, you know, that was a big concern, right? And so that's why we actually went back on the placement standards to, other than what I talked about, what the current placement standards are. Um, so there are no separate lighting zones now in this policy, um, other than sort of a streetscape, although I'm not sure we eliminated all of that, but streetscape lighting we've talked about, but there's no streetscape lighting zone per se. So we might have to go back and check that now that I think about it to make sure it makes sense now that we got rid of zones. Um, but um, the, the placement locations, other than that dead end that I I talked about would be no different than what the town is currently operating under, um, given the newest proposal that we've done because we heard about those concerns. So what would what would be the impacts of the, the standards being adopted? The lighting would be much yellower. Um, it would not be the bright blue white light that you see. It would become much yellower, um, but it would cover the same 
well, it wouldn't cover the same areas. I'm saying it would cover the same areas is wrong because it would also be shielded to stop it from covering the lawns of places. It would meant it would be meant to cover and shine only on the public way, not on the lawn locations, except in those streetscape areas like the downtown, where that the main difference there would be that it doesn't go up anymore. Um, that it's fully shielded, so it's not lighting the sky. It's lighting the streets and the sidewalks, um, you know, and so in some sense, the impacts are are much less severe than they were in our initial proposal because we've reverted back to the current placement standards. So the impacts mainly are on the shielding, the glare, the color temperature, and that that shielding that would say, don't light my lawn or don't light your lawn or make sure that it's shielded so that it's not shining in on that bedroom um, would be some of those impacts and make sure you're not lighting the sky um, so that if you're above it, um, you don't see light coming up at you. Um, I, I took a train through New York City over the holidays and the train was elevated through and in certain areas of the town I was just amazed at how well they shielded all of their lights we were above the street lights and from the top it looked really dark but that's from the top you want it from the top to look dark because you don't need to have light above the building you need the light on the streets and they have done a fantastic job in some of their areas of making sure the light only shines down and so those would be some of the impacts that if you're on the sixth floor or the fifth floor of a building or the third floor of a building and you're looking out, you don't have a light shining up into your building because it would be fully shielded from you. Um, so, but, but the parts where we were removing streetlights are no longer part of this proposal with that one exception of end of cul-de-sacs and dead ends. Um, correct. So, so I, I wanted to just make sure that that was like, so what you're saying in terms of zones and stuff Shalini is is really valid and if we bring if we bring that back as a separate proposal then 100% but all that people would see the differences in this one are what what Mandy just described does yeah. that make sense yeah okay and so so whatever is the change is what I'm saying is like how it might impact because mm -hmm. we don't know that and so we got so I mean basically have that as part of the process at some point uh, which I'm sure you will have uh, mm -hmm. as any changes requires. But I think going back, I'm not opposed to any counselor coming up with the suggestion. It's just that I don't feel equipped to say yes or no to the maximum illumination level at the public right away line abutting um, residential is sensitive using the streetscape lighting district shall not exceed 0 0.01 foot candle. I have no idea what that means. And so that's where I feel that if a staff person has gone through this with the experts and comes back and with you all, like you all could be like, you know how Anna, you did that with the water you worked with the, but if the staff person comes also and says, yes, we've looked at this, here are some challenges, here's where we think it's good. Then I feel more comfortable endorsing it versus this is a, by, a bylaw or a regulation that has been accepted in XYZ town, and these are established standards, so therefore we are going to adopt them because we don't know in our town what, and maybe they are, you know, maybe they are, but again, um, I would really like to see some sort of staff input on this. Um. Mandy, any anything to add there? Um, I would just add that do we have Paul's permission to speak to Guilford on this to get that desire that TSO seems to be wanting? Yeah, so I think for, as I think about this and read it, it's the, my first question is, does the council want to move forward on this and dedicate staff time, you know, which is precious, to this proposal? And if the answer to that is we want a new street lighting policy, then by all means, we have people who are staff. They're not experts, as James pointed out. They We have an electrician who knows what he's doing, but he's not going to know, you know what the state of the art is probably. And I think the way he described the relationship between salespeople and things coming in saying, here's the latest and greatest, you know, buy this. And also we're driven by budgets. You know, they have a limited budget. There are a lot of demands. 
and they have to make that dollar go as far as they can. Um, so the, here I'm listening, seeing if the count, and this is, um, you know, for a lot of proposals, is the council want to really dedicate efforts to this, which I think you said have said that um, that you do, and then I think you're right, Shalini, need to approach it that way to say let's bring the experts with our practitioners and come up with something. And my big thing is the implementation plan. What's our what's the time frame? What's the budget? What's it mean for our operations? Do we have to get to people with different skill sets? You know, um, our our electrician spends a lot of time fiddling with um, what were supposed to be automated um, crosswalk signals, and they're always failing. And he's supposed to be able to do it from his truck, but he can't. He has to go out. He has to plug in. All these different things. There are a lot of little complications that come along with stuff. It's in on paper it seems really good, but in practice you want to talk to the people actually doing it. And we would do that with other communities as well. You know, say what's working for you and what's not. So my, the first threshold is: is this something the council wants staff to put time into? And then we start to budget our time and our what we need to do to, to make that happen. All right, so I'm gonna, we've got two more. I'm gonna go to James and then Andy for the next question. I think, Paul, what would be the indicator that the council does or does not? Because it sounds like TSO doesn't wanna put this out of committee until we get staff input, which is understandable. And what other indicator would, would you want? You know, I, I, to be honest with you, I think a fair amount of work has already been done by the proponents. Um, so it's more probably having a meeting with the DPW, uh, the key people there and saying, how does this read to you? I mean, you, I, you've already talked with Guilford about this, I know. Um, mm -hmm. I would want our electrician to be plugged into it as well, Sean. Um, and I think, I think, you know, getting a good read, if that's what the TSO committee would feel comfortable with, we could do certainly do that. Um, James, did you have a response or is it a separate question? Uh, it was a response to the um, the question about the illumination levels. Great. Oh, I, that's what I was going to say, Shalini. I feel like you might you might learn what a foot candle is in this exact moment because uh, we have a, a astronomy. <laughs> All right, James, go ahead, and then we'll go to Andy, and then we'll wrap this one up. Sure. Foot candles are just a way of describing um, how much light is falling on a surface, like the roadway, and uh, 0 0.01 foot candles, which we're saying. And, and you know we see in this proposal here shall not exceed that at the at the uh, the property line or the boundary line uh, is the brightness of the full moon. So it's bright enough that people in the old days used to plan their travel around it because we all know that you know the full moon is normally enough to to see by. Now you might say, well, let's you know that's uh, it's it's too dim. Uh, because um, I've experienced the full moon and I couldn't see very well. Probably that's because there was some bad light poking you in the eye. Uh, so it's the combination of illumination levels being reasonable and glare control being very strict. Glare is the culprit. And whenever you have, I mean, we all know that, you know, to use a flashlight properly, you shine it away from you, not into your own eye. Um, the problem is that there are so many bad lights out there that we have all these lights poking us in the eye which makes it harder to see. And we could go into the physiology of what happens to the eye, why that is. But if you can control that glare and minimize it, then much, much lower levels of light are totally fine. So uh, the proposal is 0 0.01 foot candles at the, at the boundary. It can be brighter than that in the middle. And there are roughly 50 other cities and towns in Massachusetts that have some kind of lighting uh, regulation or bylaw, and they all have some illumination standard in there. And they vary. Um, but 0 0.01 foot candles at the at the property line is reasonable, and and you'll you'll find it in in plenty of other places. Thank you, James. Andy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think we're ready because uh, um, we got the proposal, and I think that this has been a helpful conversation, and I appreciate that uh, a lot of all of the information that has been provided. Um, I think that uh, the other group that I would like to hear from are public safety because uh, just uh, from my own experience, and I think we all have similar experience, however, driving into um, town after it's got after it's dark, but not too late at night, on my way to council meetings, as a matter of fact, during the winter, 
I frequently encounter uh, people walking in streets where there are no sidewalks, and I frequently encounter bicycle traffic. And sometimes it's easy to see, and sometimes it's not. But what makes the difference is uh, often what the bicyclist puts has in the way of their own lighting or reflectors of the clothing that they choose to wear. And the same is true for people who are on foot. Um, so, and I try and, and obviously, and I hope all of us do, hope all, everyone does, is to be careful. But you have to be vigilant. And uh, I'm sure that not everybody is as vigilant as they should be. So I really would like to hear also from public safety people about what they think is necessary lighting to assure public safety in key zones. Okay, thank you, Andy. And I'll share the other day, I saw a scary thing in a very, uh, I'm gonna say excessively, but I know that that's my opinion, street lit area where a car, there was so much, there was so much light from the street lights that the car was very much after dark driving without their headlights on and they did not notice um, because the street was so lit. Uh, and then they were suddenly in an area without street lights and they had no light. Um, and I was driving behind them and it was a little, a little scary. Uh, Dorothy, you're going to be our last comment on this. And then we're going to let Mandy and, and uh, James go about their Thursdays. So Dorothy. Okay. I just think we should also check with TAC. Um, certainly we've been talking about some of these issues, but you know, there's experts on that committee and uh, public safety, foot safety, walkers, pedestrians is, is an issue. And as we know, we had a death um, on the campus on a very poorly lit night with, uh, I think, a lot of fog, um, uh, on the, on somebody walking on the road. Um, and this is something that um, we have to be concerned about. So if we bring this up and talk about it at another meeting, uh, I would certainly like to hear from TAC. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Shalini, really, though, that la please, last one. And then, because we have a lot of other things on the agenda. I know, but um, I think just to prepare us for the next meeting, um, when this comes on the agenda, I think it will also be good. I was going to say TAC, but also DAC, maybe uh, the disabilities. Oh, yeah, week. yeah. Uh, them. And I don't think ECSE wants to because this is good for the environment. I don't think they will really, uh, but just letting them know that we're working on this, but definitely TAC and DAC. And then from the staff, we have DPW and public safety input. And um, and I think I would like a confirmation from DPW about the timing, because when they last came, I remember in my notes, it said five or six years is when we're planning to make the next change. So it would be good to have, that was when Guilford was here. So I think getting a formal confirmation from DPW about when is the expected um, change of installation of lighting, fixtures and lights expected, the lights and yeah. And, lights, I guess. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, Mandy and James, thank you both very, very much for, for joining. And um, we will uh, touch base on timing in terms of when we're ready to bring this back uh, after we have a whole lot of meetings. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, okay. We are going to move on to proposed amendments to bylaw 3.33, refuse collection and recyclable materials. Um, and we're going to start with an update from Paul. And Paul is muted. Okay. Um, see, so we have, you know, we've got received the grant of time for Susan Waite to provide the expert guidance on and basically trying to develop a, a request for information, qualification, something like that. Um, we, um, they, they have a, she has several different communities all in the same place. So she's a busy person, but she's you know ready to work on this. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow with, um, with her and with Guilford to sort of lay out the game plan for how this is going to move forward, what their time commitments are. Um, and I know they have, a, they have a lot of things on their plate for DEP. They have a there's very short staff there as well, but you know, she obviously cares about the town of Amherst. Um, we all, I think, or several of us had an opportunity to have conversations with um, providers at the MMA conference, which I 
thought was very illuminating for many of us. Um, there is interest in from other haulers uh, for our, our business. Um, so I think that's that's useful information. And then we will want to, before we put out an RFI, we want to have some communication with them to understand what how do we position ourselves the best when we do go out, if we choose to go out in this direction. So we're still in the information collecting phase. I think that's going to take some time um, to move forward on it. But so that's where we are at this moment in time. Thank you. Are there any updates from the sponsors? Shalini? I did have another question for Paul. Yeah. I know we talked about uh, identifying the staff person who would be the contact person for this. Mm -hmm. So we haven't done that yet. After tomorrow, we'll have a better sense that, you know, we do have Steve Taliga, who is runs our solid waste operation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it, it's that is the challenge is to find out who has the skill set and the time to to put into this because it, it's going to take staff time for this. Thank you. OK, and um, maybe we can hear from Dorothy and then I can. OK, sure. Dorothy. Okay. Yeah. So I have, I read through it and, and I support this wholeheartedly, but I, I found myself, I know I've read this a couple of times. So you put this stuff in the landfill and it emits methane. And I totally know that we had an incredible landfill in Roslyn, New York, right near us in Port Washington. And that was a serious problem. And it was also seeped up into houses nearby. But so we take this now and we, we put it in our little buckets and we take it to the farm. Doesn't it still emit methane? I mean, if it emits methane, if it's all together in a dump, wouldn't it emit methane at the farm? It's, You're talking about food waste, right? Yeah, I'm talking about food waste. Or what the old-fashioned word garbage. Well, garbage friends, you know. Composting is a specific process which actually helps to decompose it and make it into soil or sorry, fertilizer that can be used back, as opposed to just letting it decay on its own, which it would um Okay, so I think Darcy has a better explanation. Maybe we, she's in the, this is my understanding, a very basic layman's understanding, but if you want a more accurate understanding. It, it just, it just I really got caught my interest and I began, because I'm totally for this, okay? Even yeah. if it does, but I just wondered, how do we, how's it not emit methane because it's being composted? Okay. Um, well, the answer is, yeah. Do we want, do you want to respond to that? Go yeah, I, uh, sorry that we don't have Susan present because she actually is in the, Susan is in the audience. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Andy. Um, would it, you like to come um, in? It's up to Paul as to whether she can come in. I, you know, because I've talked with her years ago about the whole process, and it's a it, it is rather technical, but uh, way back when when I was previously working with Susan. We got one of those backyard compost things, and um, we use it on on a regular basis. And so, it's our compost is decomposing, and it is not emitting methane uh, yeah. because of the process that is being used. It's breaking. Yeah. It's because it has um, components within the compost that naturally develop that break it down from the um, compost, what we're putting into the compost bin into what we, in the end, can pull out and use in our garden as, mm -hmm. as soil. But uh, I think I would have to rely on somebody with her level of expertise to explain. I, th I think this is actually points up the need for edu additional education. Zero Waste Amherst has done a terrific job of educating people, but I think that's another opportunity mm -hmm. to people understand why do we care about this right. you know, why are we putting time and effort into it what are the benefits to the climate and to the uh, environment if we move in this direction mm -hmm. right <clears throat> can I give an update mm -hmm. then about what a couple of things uh, one is that in terms of the sponsors just because we don't want to violate open meeting law it made sense to have one person lead the the process and so that person was was supposed to be me not supposed mm -hmm. to be like i've got the permission of all the sponsors to uh and i appreciate that opportunity to lead an initiative which i have never before so i'm excited about that and um 
the other though in terms of process what we're hoping for is that we use today to just go through the bylaw and again the this proposed bylaw which is not set in stone at all but it is something that provides us a, a foundation to see what are the decision points uh, what is the information we need in order to make that decision and 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 those questions are going to be collected and sent to the staff and Susan so that when Susan is working and whether it goes into the RFQ and whatever, so they are going to work, take that information and come back to us. The main milestone that we're hoping to achieve soon with Susan is to get a very well thought through RFQ. And uh, once that is sent out and we get the responses, we will get that information from um, from Susan and staff, and that's going to help us at a lot of our decision points in terms of what is composting going to include, what is going to cost, and those kind of things. So we're going to, when we get to that, we can do. But today, I think the goal is to just collect, go line by line through the bylaw and propose bylaw. And again, knowing this is not how it may end up being, but just to get the conversation going. Uh, okay. In between, there will be opportunities for maybe we that's a question again for tso is in terms of the rfq do we want to provide feedback because we're hearing from residents we will also have the survey that was done by zero waste in communication with the town staff and on the request of susan zero waste did a survey asking residents what are their services and what is the cost and you know different getting feedback from residents about the current services so there could be an opportunity where we get to hear what our residents saying about that uh, the second thing is do we want to you uh, do we want to provide feedback to susan and the staff uh about the rfq so when she's ready with the rfq do we want her to present or the staff to present it to us so we can look at it from the lens of residents and provide feedback? That's so, a decision. Yeah. So this gets into a different area. Typically, if the council says go do an RFQ, staff goes does an RFQ. It's not a group meeting process to edit every RFQ. I mean, we're running into this in other committees as well. And it, and it sort of um it takes an enormous amount of time and um, and can be contentious at times uh, within a committee. So typically, you know, when we have done the procurement, which is what this is, we've relied on our procurement staff and whoever the, the subject matter expert on the town staff is to put the QRQ. You give us the direction mm -hmm. and, you know, we say we want to go this way and then the staff sort of do that legwork. Um, you know, it, it's just it's a it's a real time sink for staff to go to lots of meetings to talk about what right. what these five pages are going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So, okay, Dorothy. Um, I have a couple of small questions. Um, for example, why would apartments be last? Because I would think in a way they'd be easier. Um, in that same area. Uh, when we talk about um, pay as you throw, and that should help reduce costs for residents that don't use, you know, the people who are paying crazy prices now. But then I, that began to make make me worry if you pay more for dumping more or getting rid of more. Again, the illegal dumping of garbage, as, at least this used to be a big problem in some places I've lived in the past. I don't know. It may not be a problem in Amherst. Um, then it talks about um, your bill, calling your town water bill, for recycling and compostable materials pickup and for transfer station services. And that's what I wanted. I wanted that service transfer station services to be defined. Because for example, Bob and I go to the transfer station. We do not contract with USA because we don't like them and we don't like their services. So we would probably, if you do this, do you, would we stay using the transfer service as we do, but we would in, in, instead put a little bucket out in front, even though we are not, or do we have to contract with the people to put a little bucket of compost on the curb, or can we take our bucket of compost to the transfer station? So that's really been my question is how does this 
You know, because a lot of us who really are dedicated to transfer stations and, and believe in them. So I just want to know how that would work. I and appreciate that. Was, and the other last thing was I had a com com community citizen complaint that the DPW used to pick up Christmas trees. She had her Christmas tree in her front lawn and they weren't doing it. And I see on page four, uh, it talks about yard waste, leaf pickup and bulky waste items. And I thought, oh, that could be another way to sell this if you would say yes, and we'll pick up your Christmas tree. Um, Cause you know, we've got to, you say, we've got to get this across of, of changing a way of doing business. But so my, my main question is how did, how did the transfer station people fit into this new plan? Okay, so before Shalini, if it's okay, before we jump into that, I also want to respect that Sh what Shalini had also asked of us is to go line by line through. Um, and so I'm going to have, a, I'm, I'm going to take the answer to this and then Andy's question as well, but then I'd like to just be cognizant of time and, and getting to what the sponsors wanted to do. But Shalini uh, or Andy, would you like to respond? No, to I was that? actually raised my hand in order to volunteer to provide the answer. Um, so it was not a separate question. Even better, I love it. Go ahead. <laughs> the, the transfer station, it's envisioned that the transfer station still remains an option, that people will still be able to choose whether they want um, curbside pickup through the town um, contracted service or use the transfer station. Okay. And I still assume that the transfer station will be the less expensive uh, option because you're providing a different kind of service that is less uh, expensive. Second thing you asked about, it was about compost. I guess I have to remind you that there are compost buckets on the right side of the drop-off area. <clears throat> and um, so that there already okay. is a compost okay. component within the um, uh, transfer station option that currently exists and the christmas trees which of course people can drop off if they have a um, um i think i think they have to have a sti uh, sticker i'm not sure but at the uh um at the landfill or um, other people who collect them like women who, um, who has the goats and always is advertising that she welcomes yeah. christmas trees but um Christmas trees were actually picked up by the prior haulers. They, I don't think they were picked up by the town. So that if you had a contract with Amherst Trucking when it existed as a separate company or do so, they would come around and pick up your Christmas trees, usually on the first Friday after the New, yeah. Year, holiday, <clears throat> New Year holiday week. But um, I think think i'm not sure but i think that usa trucking has not provided that service after it bought out those two companies mm -hmm. i believe you're correct andy although my my joke potential revision to your bylaw is to include some sort of goat brigade for post uh post christmas tree pickup um because nice. yes i also love finding someone with goats to bring it Shalini, would you like to um, share your screen with the with the proposed bylaw on it, or would you? I can pull it up. Otherwise, I think I do have it up, which I could. But I also have a lot of other notes, um, which is fine. Which everyone can see because they're just questions that I've put on the side. So whichever, it's up to you. I um, I'm using two situations, so just give me a second. I can, and then... I can pull it. I can pull it. Up. Okay, that'd be great. Um, share screen. Let me make sure I haven't said any mean things about anyone. <laughs> yes, if, you're, if you're not sure, then call on Anna. <laughs> Who's yes. to say I haven't? I'm no, just kidding. I have. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so first we Anna, start. Can you full screen it really quickly? Yes. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, we don't. Are, we're not looking at your desktop. Thank you. Oh yeah, and that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, we start. Is this, Jordi, can you see it? Is it big enough for everyone to read? What it bigger? I, I personally can read it. Is anyone else unable to? Jordi, bigger? He's saying something I can't make out. Bigger? I said, I said oh, okay, that's better. Okay. okay. 
All right, so purpose, do we want to add anything here uh, in terms, this is very important because that's a question Paul always asks me when we, whenever I've talked to him is like, what is your goal here? Like, um, what do we want to achieve with this bylaw? So what we already have is written, I don't want to read it, but if you want to just take a minute to just go over it again. Just the last one was not in the original, so the one that's highlighted here with the goal of meeting time, this was actually in later on in the proposed bylaw, which I've pulled it up under here if you want to say something to that effect or not. Shelly, this is not the document that would- Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm having the same question. No. Yeah, I, I printed the document that was posted with the meeting. Oh, okay. And um, that that's not what you put up. Oops, my so, bad. So you're gonna stop sharing while you're... Yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the document that was in the packet um, was proposed amendments to bylaw 3.33, refuse collection and recyclable materials bylaw. Okay, I'm pulling it up now. Oh, that is the proposed changes, that one. Oh, I thought uh, going through the, yeah, what's in here is more the proposed, I, what, what we were planning to do is go through the bylaw language line by line. What's in the document looks like it's a memorandum. Is that what you're looking at? So the memorandum was what was in the packet. I don't know that we're going to be able, I, I mean, I haven't seen the. That's all that was there. Language. Yeah, the bylaw actually. Um, Shalini, I would suggest we not do that tonight because as sponsors, we haven't reviewed the bylaw yet one more time for what we're what mm -hmm. where we are with it. And uh, it's not the item that was provided to the committee. Um, let me just see what is in our agenda. Proposed amendments to bylaw committee quest. So it does say proposed amendments to bylaw 3.3 committee questions to the bylaw so it is on the agenda and i think even in terms of andy if you have any concerns about the process or because it is not again this is not the final bylaw it's just to provide us some to make sure that any possible questions and decision points that we have we are thinking through them Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause this for a second, Shalini. I um I don't think we have a copy of the bylaw in in it's not in this memorandum. Um I'm looking back through, I did I read it, but I I don't believe I think you have you outlined the proposed changes and so maybe we can talk through what we think about those. Um but I'm I mean, you don't have it as in like you've never, I mean, because this was in the, when we passed, it was with the memorandum, but you're saying it's not in the packet. It is not in the packet. Yeah. So, so would it be helpful to the sponsors for us to talk about the proposed changes? Um, or would it be helpful to, to um, table this until the next meeting sure. and get- I mean, we can at least go through that. And it was in a previous packet, so is the the is because it is on the agenda, so it's not like we're violating any law. And in terms of um, that was on the agenda is to look to pro provide questions to the proposed bylaw, not to the memorandum to the bylaw. I understand that, but unfortunately, the bylaw is not in the it like the bylaw wasn't in the packet. I know I haven't reviewed it since the last time I reviewed. Yeah, but, what was I know, but see, the point is that. If you when if you look, we can it's a very short bylaw. We can just go through it. The only purpose is to gather the questions. And if there are additional questions, you can send it to me afterwards. But Dorothy, like the questions you shared is exactly what. But if people are not feeling prepared to go through the questions, um, okay. So I'll open it now. Then, if folks do have questions, now would be the time to to ask them. Yeah, it's like in terms of the compostable materials, there is a very detailed description in the definition. That was one of the changes that is proposed is the definitions. So, okay, so I'll, I guess I'm going to, I'll raise my hand and start because my my question was that this this says that they're, 
the proposed changes would provide a definition of mm -hmm. compostable materials. And I was, my question is, what is that definition? Um, yes. And so I, I think that was what I, I was really wanting to see the, the changes so that I could look through them that, um, so I, I'm not looking for an answer to that specific one, but I think that I'm, I was curious about how these were going to be um, specified out. So yeah, so the proposed bylaw does provide a definition which includes all organic materials, food scraps, full soil. But did you want me to answer what it is, but you, or you wanted to know the process for define, find, arriving at the definition? Nope, I, I wanted to know what, I, I wanted to see the bylaw, that's all. Um, and so I was, I, cause I was trying to picture all of these things. Um, and so, sure, if I'm, I'm happy to hear the, the definition. You want me to just, again, share my screen because that is the proposed bylaw that was in the, that has been in the packets all through. Um, okay, okay so there's no, there's no different definitions. What do you mean different definitions? Maybe come back to me. Dorothy, what's your, what's your question? Because I do have a question about the, can I just share the screen? Uh, uh, Shalini, when I prepare for a meeting, I go check the packet. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if I've seen something. Sometimes I see something 20 times and they're different every time. I do have printed copies of everything someplace. Okay. But when I prepare for a meeting, I read through the packet. I read through the packet and it included the memorandum, which I thought was very interesting, but it did not include the bylaw. So I do not feel prepared to discuss the bylaw today. Okay, the fact so that it's on the agenda does not mean that we have to, it just means that we can. So okay. we often have things on the agenda that we actually don't discuss, but Lynn would say, put it on just in case we have the time, you know? So okay. I'm going to hang up one second. I'm sorry. We, we got to go back to the, the hand raising thing here. Um, we also do have one more item on our agenda. So I'm going to give this about a couple, we're going to give this a couple more minutes to see what we can hash out. Maybe what it makes sense to hash out is what we're going to look at the next time we discuss it um, and what you want us to come prepared with if it if it's specific questions or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So so why don't we go ahead, Shalini, and then, um, but it sounds like this will be a, a continued discussion unless folks are feeling otherwise, but please, let's please um, keep raising hands so I can keep track of it. Okay, so we could go through the proposed changes that Dorothy is mentioning in the document that was, I'll just share that. Sure, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what you had. Mm -hmm. And so this does include, uh, talks about a definition of compostable materials. And so that could be one of the questions that we need to get. And I think it will come also, what is our ideal goal is that it does include plants and la lawn, um, like Christmas trees and all that. But again, I think that's going to be something that's going to go into the RFQs in terms of what are the cost components of the different pieces is how I'm imagining it. Because it's possible that it's all we're able to afford all of it, which is amazing because more people will be interested if your yard waste is also collected, but if it bumps up the price a lot and it's not accessible, then it might have to be, this is a basic compost bill, but if people want the yard waste and they pay a little bit more. So there are all those different things around what the compostable material will include. So the question then for us is, do we want the definition of the compostable specific in the bylaw or do we put it in the regulations? Because a lot of the details in this are going to go into the regulations. So that's a decision point for us. Okay. Should Does I just have any strong thoughts on that in this moment? Uh, Paul? Yeah, I think the model that we should be try always trying to be following is uh, create a bylaw that's pretty general. We've What we did with the water and sewer regulations and then have the detail in the regulations that's so much easier for the council to adjust over time because yes. things are going to change all the time. Exactly. And so I think, you know, if we start to think about this in terms of what's in the bylaw and what should be in the regulations, mm -hmm. that will, we can start to pull apart what those two things are. And mm -hmm. it, it means we have to do, do different actions, but I think that's a much better way. The, the, the bylaw lays out the framework for what you want to cover, and then the regulations gives it the detail, like what is part of, com, you know, 
of composting that can change from year to year even, you know. Right. Okay, so specificity in regulations, more general in bylaws as a, as a rule. Yeah, does everyone agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the second one was something that Dorothy had mentioned in terms of um, when do we start and who do we start with? Um, and I think that again is something that um, has to come from the staff and RFQs because um, apartments have their own contracts. And so if we are hoping for them to join us, then what is that transition going to look like from that contracts? And then also, if you're only doing it with residential, resident, uh, single family homes or owner occupied, whatever, um, is that enough number of households for a hauler to be interested in? Will it be viable for a hauler to just focus on, you know, would that make the cost higher? So, I mean, those are the kind of things, again, that would go in, right? Are you Andy, looking for? Okay. Andy has his hand up. No, I know. I wasn't sure if you were um, asking that as a question or not. Andy, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I think that the original proposal was that we would start with uh, sing, uh, homes that are um, single family rented or on residential streets that uh, because it covers the greatest number of customers. It is also the, the population that is going to be um, around for the longest period of time in this complexity um, with apartment and renters. Renters, by and large, um, uh, have a shorter stay because you have a lot of student renters and they can turn over every year, every couple of years. And then you have to go through an entire re-education process and that we want to try and get it up and running for as many households as possible in a stable fashion as quickly as possible. And that would mean not doing the apartment complexes because, and then the other problem, and I think that we know this from the work that um, the uh, DPW did when they had Mimi Kaplan working for them for a year on a grant program, that the education component is much more difficult and the enforcement of the regulations is much more difficult in an apartment complex because it's not just what the owner, the landlord wants, but it's what the residents of the apartment are complying by. And for all of those reasons, the uh, zero waste Amherst proposal and the uh, which was then adopted by the um, sponsors was to start with. Uh, with, with uh, the way that it was originally proposed, <clears throat> um, I think this is going to this is getting far too complex for tonight. And I actually, um, with all due respect, Chalini, I haven't had a chance to look at what all of these uh, like um, changes are, and I'm a co-sponsor, so I'm a little bit uncomfortable with continuing the discussion. Change. Can you speak more to the changes? What do you mean? Well, uh, for example, um, you were just about to go over the uh, definition of compostable, which was what was proposed in the bio proposed bylaw. It's nothing has changed since what we proposed and attached to the memorandum. That was in the original. Yeah, here. And this then is it isn't something that that's being done that was responsive to the prior request for more information, then I stand corrected and I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so okay. we're gonna go to, Dor we're gonna go to Dorothy and then um, it sounds like what might be helpful Shalini is um, if you can really clearly tell us what you're looking for from us for next meeting so that we can all be better prepared. Um, Dorothy. So, you know, everybody meets on Thursday and I've been hopping from one Zoom to another all day. So there's a little cross fertilization here talking about student rentals. 
that's a place I can see as a problem with this because uh, they're in residential houses and residential neighborhoods, which is where we're going to start it. And um, I don't know whether we can count on good cooperation. And, and that's a, an added thing. And I think we have to think about that in terms of the rental registration as well, because this would be adding a, uh, a, a you know, a, some, a new requirement on the um, either the owner, the manager, or the students. But if they just leave it to the students, it'll be chaos. That's my comment. So would your question, Dorothy, be the, how would we enforce the yes. processing by yes. law, especially right. with... Because um, that, that would be part of the ro rollout of the easier, yeah. you know, uh, owner-occupied houses, the residential neighborhoods, but they're a very big part of many residential neighborhoods and they do present unique challenges um, if the, unless they're owner occupied, you know? So okay. that, that has to be thought about. Yeah, so that's the kind of questions we're looking to put down that would be in the enforcement part and also the education part. Like how do we educate people and get everyone on board? Why right. this is so important because we're running out of landfills because of methane, all of those things. So that'd be part of the education and enforcement. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my comment is, uh, I want to I want to push back a little bit on the fact that it would be hard to get students to do this. If you look at trends of of uh, who's actually kind of working on on environmental issues, it's millennials and Gen Z more than anybody else. And uh, we see this at the colleges, especially. It's become routine for a lot of people, um, for especially students. So I think it's valid to talk through enforcement, but I'd really like to detach that from from generational and, and students. Yeah, um, I just sorry. And that, that's, I mean, that's data, like we have data on that. So I just. So, okay. You're saying, you're saying a house of male students would do it as well as a house of female students. Okay. I, I, I will, I will wait and see. I'm, I'm not going to respond to that. Um, are there any other, any other. Okay. Last, go ahead, Shalini. Last one. I just, I'm just putting it as a question. How do we enforce the composting bylaw? And yeah, I think that's a great, I, that's, I and think. then education for different people in different ways. Yeah. Great. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and move us to the next thing on our agenda. Cause I also see that Amy Rusecki is here. Um, and so Shalini, will you, um, yeah, what are not. our, what is our homework for the next? Okay. Next so day? I, do you want me to send the bylaw itself to everyone? And so <clears> if you go over it by line by line again, if there's anything you do not agree with or you have questions or what would help you to make that decision point um those are the questions if you could write down like who do we start with when do we start the paid bylaw what is you know any questions that you have compostable what is that going to look like what should be in the bylaw what should be in the regulations so the bylaw is more longer lasting regulations are what keep changing so as paul explained so so those are the kind of things if you can send your questions should they send them to me or just bring them so we should bring them um yeah. i mean it, people could individually send you questions um but i also think if you could just have the bylaw placed in the packet and then we, for the next meeting and we can refer to that that would be i think that would be best any questions about the process though before we move on because I think for the public and everyone, I want, you know, this has been brought up a couple of times that people feel that we are, you know, we are putting the horse before the, no, we're putting the cart before the horse. So I don't want anyone to feel like this is a done deal and we're set, it's not set in stone. This is just to provide us a framework to have this conversation, think through what are the decision points we need to move forward in a thoughtful way that it's feasible, that it's accessible, it's affordable for our students and what does the staff think? And um, yes, so. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you very much um, for all your work on this, Shalini and Andy and other um, sponsors. All right, so we're gonna move on to proposed water and sewer regulations, um, but I wanna jump ahead really quickly. Paul, I'm looking ahead on the agenda uh, under item nine, review of future agenda items and council referrals is the surveillance use policy. There is nothing on that in our packet. Um, do you have, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to plan ahead here in terms of timing, because I had thought this was sort of our last thing because this, there was nothing else in the packet. Do you have something on that that you plan to need time for? Um, I guess not because it's not in the packet, um, but I did send a, you know, when okay. I sent a memo some couple months ago to the council that we should have put that into packet, but so 
you haven't had a chance to review it in detail. I mean, you have it, but it's from a couple months ago, I think. Okay. And also, if that was really going to be on the agenda, we should have the police chief here. Yeah. I, okay. I think we, I think Anika, we agreed that that was not going to be this, but the next meeting. Perfect. Love that. Yeah. It's a it's a coming attraction. All right. Let's move on to uh, water and sewer regulations, y'all. I can like see yeah. the finish line. Um, so we are. Uh, I feel like Amy, the fact that you run ultra marathons and the fact that this has been, you run ultra marathons or normal marathons, either way, you run long distances. Uh, this feels like the policy version of that sometimes. So um, I'm glad that you're coaching us through it here. Um, we are going to start with an update from finance committee. And then um, the, the decision on the table before TSO is whether or not we would like to change our recommendation to the council to match what finance committee uh, said. So I'm going to ask for an update from Andy. I'll ask for, um, for any updates from Amy that if you have any. Um, and then we will decide whether or not we'd like to, if someone would like to make a motion to change our uh, recommendation or not. All right. So, and we're going to do all of that relatively quickly. So Andy, take it away. Yeah. And Donna, is, uh, since you're also in finance, uh, you should be plugging in and switching roles when you need to, to right. talk about what you saw happening in finance. But basically, I think that we recognize the same, we're at the same place that we were uh, last time we talked about this as a committee, because there was a recommendation that was made by uh, Finance Director Mangano that um, we take the portion of the bylaw that would change ownership of water and sewer lines between the main and the property line that, change, that was proposing to change the ownership from the um, customer to the enterprise funds um, and delay um, that decision for two years until we obtain more information. When it, and that was adopted by the finance committee and then this committee um, decided that it would prefer to take a slightly different tack on it but not substantially different because what was being proposed was to uh, delay the implementation of that change for two years, but to go ahead and to actually adopt the change. Now, and the obvious difference is that two years hence, as new, inf as new information is available, under the um, original and continuing finance committee proposal, the finance committee would, um, the, in council and TSO at that time, would look at the new information and decide whether to uh, make this additional change. Whereas under the TSO proposal, it was kind of the opposite. In two years from now, we would essentially get the same information um, and have the uh, council and its committees decide um, whether um, to reverse that portion of the decision that had been the delay with the delayed effective date. And that was essentially the difference. And we talked a little bit about the reasons to do it. Um, I think that the one uh, statement that was made was, that it would uh, create a situation where a homeowner might be able to say, after finding out that there's a problem with that section of the line, oh, I'm just going to delay until after the two-year period, and then it's uh, um, I don't have to pay for it anymore. But I think that that could be addressed through how we write the bylaw, so that doesn't, in and of itself, answer the question. And then the uh, finance committee, the other thing that was brought forward and why I suggested that Anna be free to talk because she was the spokesperson from the perspective of wanting to have the council go ahead and implement the change if it thought that the change was the appropriate thing to do and to say that this is where we are going as opposed to leaving the decision for a new council two years from now. Um, but I'm not wanting to put 
um, words in your mouth. And if I have misstated it, and I wanted to give make sure that you were going to seize the opportunity to say, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, but I a after the discussion at the council meeting, the decision uh, or the finance committee meeting was um, the finance committee uh, suggested that um, give it, even with the fineness of the difference that um, it was uh, suggesting that we force the decision at the appropriate time and that um, there be a time date put on it as to when it was happened and so that it would have to be in time to go into effect on uh, July, July 1st of uh, what would be 25, I believe, and that that would be the, uh, uh, by putting a date on it, it would force the decision. So that's where the finance committee ended up. Um, so it was kind of back to this, uh, to TSO, because uh, I think that what we didn't want to do is make the decision and discussion at the council more difficult if we could avoid it and having two different versions um, going, or two different concepts going to the uh, council is uh, problematic. And the other thing that we were conscious of, but I think that this is really up to uh, Lynn as president to figure out a methodology if um, it comes to that, so that Amy doesn't have to uh, develop two regulations under that comply with both committees but could get some indication of where the council wants to go before she has to do it. So she wants to totally do it once. Uh, so uh, I think that's my report um, and leave it to you and Amy to add to it. Thank you, Andy. Um, I wanna set a quick parameter here. I don't think we need to rehash our entire conversation from the last time we discussed this issue. I think that what we need to decide is not the merits of the plan of the motion that we made last time and voted on, but whether or not we would like to, if, and if someone wants to come out and make that motion right away, that's fine too, whether we would like to change the motion that we um, made last time to match what finance said. Um, that's the goal. I'm not trying to rehash the whole thing again. Uh, we, we have limited time here. So um, Dorothy. I do not want to change our motion. I wanted to, I think our motion is much more just. I go to meeting after meeting. And we talk about our taxes rising for lots of reasons. We're building this, we're doing overrides, all kinds of things. And what have we done? What are we, have we done for the homeowner that has to worry about costs and expenses? This is the least served group in our town right now. Um, and I, I feel, I would feel absolutely, um, betrayed betrayed that the work that we did in coming up with this which is a fair regulation would be put off to be redecided by the finance committee at some point which is just another way of saying killing it softly killing it slowly so i am very much against changing the tso's motion i'm sorry the finance committee felt and i know that um, alicia was not in the meeting when that happened um i don't know if that would have changed the vote I was listening, but I had to get off to pick up my grandson. Um, I, I'm very upset about this. So I, I do not want to change our motion. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, one quick, clear, two quick clarifications. There actually wasn't a vote in finance. The motion never got a second. Um, and the second is that second point is that um, it would go back to the full council, not just the finance committee. Uh, I don't think that changes your point, but just wanted to be, be clear. Yeah. Any other um, questions? Andy? Yeah, no, I just wanted to respond to Dorothy on that. There's going to be an additional expense to somebody. And I think that what you have to recognize, and we all have to recognize, is that if we go forward with the TSO approach, the water rates go up for everybody. And there's an amount of money that's going to be collected that's going to cover repair costs if it goes in, when it, when it goes into effect. And uh, 
we're talking about now two years from now, not now, but assuming it goes into effect, the water, the, the water rates for everybody goes up or homeowners um, at that point will probably have a choice, bear the risk that if the um, uh, lines that run to or from their house um, become a problem, that they're gonna have to pay the cost or they have to make the decision to buy insurance, which uh, the, uh, Paul has been working on developing and has identified an insurance option that would allow people to purchase insurance. But there is a cost that is gonna be borne by our taxpayers, either everybody through the uh, uh, water rate increase or by a select group of those people who purchase insurance, or if they don't purchase insurance, bear a risk of paying the, the entire cost of repair should their line be the problem. Thank you, Andy. Dorothy? The insurance of people who've looked into some of the private purchase of insurance, nowhere could come up close to cover the cost for many, many people. The unfairness of somebody like L.C. Fetterman having to pay for cleaning, changing the street is ridiculous. What will happen to homeowners who are in a more precarious position is that they will have to try to get a second mortgage if they actually have that ability and the chances of having a, a, losing their homes. So I, I think it's a really extreme situation. And we did find we've compared our water rates with other local towns, nearby towns, and our rates were lower, which is why we were when we did that little raise last year or this year. I don't know what year it was. It wasn't that upsetting because it was still our rates were very still lower and they are still lower than than the neighboring towns. So I, I feel that I was spared total destruction because I happen to have insurance. But when friends of mine tried to buy some like that, they were not able to. So it's it's the insurance option is not really a good answer. And it might have cost over thirty thousand dollars. So. Paul, Paul can explain the insurance option, but uh, under any circumstance, uh, right now where we're at, if we don't do anything, then uh, somebody who's caught in the position that you described, naming that one particular taxpayer, uh, that's that still would be there. That hasn't that hasn't changed because under the present. Uh, regulation that's mm -hmm. there. If we make the change, it is going to involve a substantial water increase. And the other thing to that, because of what was reported to the council at the last meeting and discussed at the finance committee meeting, um, we're going to have to um, incur additional costs for Centennial, which will raise the rates anyway. So that there's already going to be a substantial increase, so it's going to be a larger increase, and that's the choice. And uh, I don't think there's any perfect answer to this one. It'd be so easy if there were. Um, I'm happy to entertain a motion. Otherwise, um, the TSA recommendation will stand. Would anyone like to make a, a motion regarding the the water and sewer regulations? So I will make the motion um, as you did last time at the finance committee meeting, except in reverse. I would move the the uh, TSO committee amend its uh, uh, prior action and uh, that it concur with the recommendation to um, have the change the decision on the change in two years after or, or in time to make implementation on July 1st of 2025. Can you say that again, Andy? Because I, I sorry, I'm yeah, sorry. I, I know because I, 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 I feel like that's what we said right. last time. And so I want to make yeah. sure. It would, yeah. it, it's it, the, the motion would be to um, amend the prior recommendation of the town services and outreach committee that it adopt a regulation 
that um, does not change ownership of the um, lines between the main and the property line mm -hmm. until um, a, a decision is made um, and that that decision will be made in time for implementation if chosen by the council on July 1, 2025. Okay, is there a second? Finance all over again. Confirming there is no second to the motion. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is what happened in finance, y'all. Um, so that's 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 okay. Um, Kelly, our note taker, who is recording. I hope that you got that. Um, Shalini, do you have a question? Yeah. I mean. I guess I just want to hear from Andy again, the way I'm thinking about it, that even though we have the centennial because of that and increase across the board, but in my mind still, we are spreading the cost across all people, which is less than it affecting one single person who could lose their home, as Dorothy explained. So in my, I mean, can you explain to me what was the finance because I didn't listen in or follow that conversation in Paul wants to say something. Paul, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think the, the basic difference is, is that TSO and Finance Committee agreed that the service line ownership should change to where the, so whoever owns the property owns the service line. What's different between what Finance Committee says, um, TSO said, and it will change to ownership, th that change will happen on date certain two years from now. Mm -hmm. And what the finance committee says, the town council will review it two years ago. So it's a matter of one, it will default into action or it will be considered for action. That's the basic, it's not a huge difference between, so substantively you're on the same page with finance. It's just a matter of, is it gonna happen automatically or is it gonna be up for review in two years? And I'll, I'll share my perspective on why I would rather it happen automatically is that it's a new council who has not gone through this, these entire regs. And so right. I was thinking about that. Um, and that if our town staff uh, or counselors had concerns, they could bring it back up for review. It could be reviewed. Um, that was my, those are my two main points. Um, all right. Shalani, anything? Yeah, go ahead. And I would just support that. You know, and my another point would be that I think it gives residents some consolation that this is moving. Otherwise, it's like, oh, they're going to go and decide it. it. You know, they didn't really decide they're going to review. So it leaves it up in the open, doesn't mm -hmm. give any assurance to the residents. So I think I, I would I agree with what you just said and what Dorothy is saying. All right. Exciting times. Motions on motions. Um, Amy, do you have anything that you, I apologize. I feel like I did not actually ask you to, I, I'm so sorry. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to add or say? Not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> you guys covered it. And uh, I, I just want direction on how to write this. And like I said, to me, the most important part, I get that this is a big portion to you guys, but there's a lot of other things in the race oh, that are in equally way. important to move forward. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm glad that we all agree on all the other stuff, we do, but, we do. you know, um, at the end of the day, we just, we want some direction so that it's not holding up everything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, Paul? Yeah. So I think the next step is we'll try, we'll try and frame a memo for the council for your next meeting on the 27th to say here, everything in the regulations, everybody agrees with, except there's one, this one decision point. And we'd like direction from the council on this decision point, and hopefully they can vote that that night, and then we could go back, change it all, do the work, so Amy doesn't have to do it twice, doesn't have to do different versions in front of you, and then bring that back. So we can, I don't think they, we can take that straight to the council. We don't have to go through the committee process anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree. I started no, drawing the map last time about where it went, and then I got lost. Yeah. Um, Yes, uh, Paul. That sounds great. Is that a memo you're able to prepare? With we will. With, yes, we, we other, with Amy. Okay. I think he's using the royal we, which means we will do this. Amy, I'm so excited to read your memo. Yes, yes, yes. 
Um, okay, Amy, thank you very much. I know it's a late night. Appreciate you being here. Um, and we will let you go and we'll see you at a full council meeting, which is thrilling for everyone. All right, thank Thanks, you. Thanks guys. Um, okay, we are gonna move on. I I personally do not have any announcements. Um, does anyone else have any, any announcements that they'd like to share? Okay. Um, future agenda items coming down the pike. Uh, we will be talking about our surveillance use uh, policy at some point in the near future. Um, and we look forward to a memo from Paul on the, uh, from, from Paul. I now I'm nervous about saying Paul's gonna do a memo. Um, we no, look you, at the materials that were referred to us um, from Paul yeah. at a prior council meeting to be discussed but, at a later DSO. Yes. So you, you do have a memo that outlines, it's the in-car video that happens with police cruisers. Yep. So you have that memo, but I think you'll have a lot of questions about it. So having someone from the police department here to answer your questions is, and, and the rule with your new surveillance bylaw, when there is a, a technology that is surveillance, the council has to approve it. And you have a certain number of days to do that. You have plenty of time, but we were to, you know talking with Anika, just let's line that up for your next, probably the 20, whatever your next meeting. Um, and have that come before you then. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, I don't. I don't have any unanticipated items, and um, with that, I believe we are set to adjourn. Unless anyone has a really good reason for us not to. No, I'd love to have, love to have dinner. Thank you. All right. I can I just declare us adjourned. I feel like I should know yes. this by now. All right, oh, I'm declaring yes. us adjourned at 8:46 p.m. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful. evening. Thank you. Bye.